Hey, welcome back to Drowning in Yarn. I'm Caleb. Today we're talking about knitting terms and phrases that might confuse beginners as they're starting to venture into the world of knitting. Some of these terms and phrases really tripped me up when I first started knitting. So I wanted to create this sort of video dictionary so that you don't have to experience that like confusion that I had as a new knitter. We have so much to cover, so I don't wanna waste any time. So let's start with acronyms. Acronyms are so common in knitting and they can be really confusing because sometimes you see them with no context as to what they mean. So let's jump right into the list of acronyms and start with acronyms that denote kind of the status of your project, starting with a whip, anything that you've cast it on, so you've started the project and you're in the middle of and you're actively working on is a whip or a work in progress. When you're done with that whip, it turns into an FO, which is a finished object. So that means that you've cast it off, you've bound off the stitches, and you're done with it. Some people also use the term HO or a half object, and that you really want to think about like you finished one mitten out of a pair or one sock out of a pair, and you either have started or haven't started that second one, so you have a half object. You'll also hear UFO, which is related to whip, because that means an unfinished object. The difference, I think, is really that a UFO is something that you've set aside and you're not actively working on. You've kind of forgotten about it or decided not to finish it. Those are the typical acronyms that you're going to hear for the kind of status of a project. So let's move on to LYS or local yarn store. Think your mom and pop or fiber art specific store and not your big box craft stores like Michael's and Joanne here in the US. Next, we're gonna talk about some community knitting terms. So you're gonna hear knit along, K-A-L, or make along, M-A-L, a lot if you're knitting online or going to an LYS, a local yarn store. It just means a group of people are knitting together. Sometimes that means that they're all knitting the same pattern, but sometimes it just means that they're knitting together with certain rules. So you'll see knit alongs around certain designers. Andrea Mowry often has knit alongs where you knit one of her sweater patterns. And all you have to do to qualify as part of the knit along is pick one of her patterns and knit it. Knit alongs and make alongs are so much fun. And if you've never done it, I recommend you do because you can really learn a lot by knitting along with people. It just gives you that little push and that community involvement, whether in person or online, is just so fun and motivating. Next, we'll talk about types of needles that you'll often hear about. Your basic needles are straight needles. Those are just the needles that you picture when you think of knitting. Like if you're watching a cartoon and there's a character knitting, they're gonna be using straight needles. Next, you'll often see DPNs or double pointed needles. They're very similar to straight needles and they're used to knit small circumferences in the round. After that, you'll see circular needles, which are needles attached to a cable that holds your stitches in between the needles. You can use circular needles for everything that you knit. You can knit things flat in the round. You can use something called magic loop to knit small circumferences in the round on long circular needles instead of using double pointed needles. And you can get interchangeable needles, which are circular needles that have cables where you can twist off the needle tip from the cable and create any combination really of cable length and needle size. So you buy one set and it really encompasses all the needles that you need. You're often gonna see people using interchangeable needles and circular needles, but some projects are really appropriate for double pointed needles and straight needles. It's really helpful to know what the universe is of needles so that you can find what works best for you. Next, we're gonna talk about yarn. I'll briefly touch on yarn weight, which is the thickness of yarn, but really that's a topic all to its own. So when you go shopping for yarn at a big box craft store, you'll see yarns labeled with a numbering system. Those numbers correspond to weights that you'll see if you go to a local yarn store and you'll often hear online. So those weights from lightest to the bulkiest sort of typical yarn weight are lace, fingering, sport, DK, worsted, then you'll see chunky or bulky, and then you're gonna see super chunky or super bulky. Those are important whenever you're reading patterns, though your pattern's also always gonna give you a gauge, and that's really what's more important. And that gauge is typically taken over a four by four inch square, and what gauge refers to is the number of stitches per inch and the number of rows per inch. Those numbers, when combined with the stitch counts, result 
in how you determine how big your project's going to be. Gauge is a complex topic. It involves yarn weights and needle sizes and can be a long video all to its own, but that's the basic information you really need to know. And the way you find that gauge is by knitting something called a swatch. Really, it's a little sample of your fabric that you then block, which is something we're gonna talk about in a moment, and then you measure. So you're gonna measure over a larger surface than one inch. And you're gonna measure in the center of that fabric and see how many rows per inch and how many stitches per inch you get. When you pick a pattern, you take that gauge that's given in the pattern and you try to achieve that. And if you achieve the same gauge, you know that your finished object is gonna end up almost the exact same size that the pattern designer knit. So swatches are very important and can tell you a lot about your project. A moment ago, I mentioned blocking your swatch, and that's important because you want to wash the swatch in the same way that you're gonna wash the finished garment. So you can see if the gauge changes when that yarn kind of takes on water and relaxes. So blocking is really just washing your finished object, so swatch, sweater, socks, whatever, the same way that you would wash it typically. You'll typically see people wet block things, which means completely submerging it in water, letting it soak, then laying it out to dry. Or you can steam block things. Steam is really helpful because it isn't gonna change the shape of your garment. Some yarns, when wet blocked, can really grow. Steam blocking is a really nice alternative. It can really set your stitches, help your yarn kind of plump if you're using wool. It's very helpful, I've heard, if you're knitting with acrylic. So steam blocking is a good option. That's a really basic description of gauge, swatching, blocking, but it's helpful to know those concepts because then you can know what you're gonna be looking for if you wanna learn more about those things. And I think now, after we're kind of thinking about swatching, is a good time to talk about different basic stitch patterns that you're gonna see most often when you're a beginner. So the first thing you might learn is garter stitch. And if you were knitting flat, so knitting like a scarf or a dishcloth, garter stitch would be when you knit every row. So you knit the first row, turn your work, knit, turn your work, and knit. You would end up with these ridges and this really plump, beautiful fabric. So then the next thing that you might wanna learn would be stockinette, which is when you knit a row, flip your work, and then you purl the whole row, because a purl is just the backside of a knit stitch. Flip it again, that third row would be knit, flip it, then you would purl. And that is how you end up with a fabric that is all knit stitches on one side and all purl stitches on the other side. And sometimes you'll hear a term reverse stockinette, and that's just the backside of stockinette. And it's oftentimes used in a pattern where the side that you're gonna to show to the world is that purl side. You're really just knitting stockinette and just choosing the purl side to be the right side. And right side and wrong side is something you often hear. And some people don't like that because it makes it sound like that wrong side is bad. And it's not. It's oftentimes thought of as inside and outside. So the right side would be the public facing side of your work. And the wrong side would be kind of the private side of your work. So the inside of a sweater. Now there's a lot of other stitch patterns that you can learn, but those are the basic ones that you're going to see as a beginner knitter. And I think it's really important to know what those are because even complex patterns use these really basic kind of stitch patterns. So now we're almost at the end of my list and the next two are two of my favorite because they're so ridiculous. The first one is tinking. So it's just the word knit spelled backwards, tink. And what that means is to undo your work stitch by stitch. This is what you would do if you're knitting along and you realize like five stitches ago you messed up, you did the wrong thing, and you would just undo each stitch before that to get back to that problematic stitch. If you were to realize that you just hated what you were doing or you messed up or you're just practicing and you wanna rip back and start over, you would do something called frog your work. So frogging your work is taking your needles out and just ripping the work out entirely. So just completely undoing your work. And that's called frogging because a frog goes ribbit, ribbit, and you're ripping it, so rip it, rip it. It's ridiculous, and that's why it's one of my favorites. I hope you don't have to frog your work ever, but honestly, we all do. Every single knitter ever has realized that they don't like what they're doing or they don't wanna do it anymore or they messed up or whatever. And those are the projects that are gonna teach you the most. It's really frustrating, but it's not time wasted. So just remember that whenever that time comes, cause it will. 
And leave me a comment down below if there are words that tripped you up when you were a new knitter or words that are still confusing to you. And maybe as a community, we can help each other out. If you enjoyed this video and found it helpful, I would love if you hit the little like button down below and hit that subscribe button and the bell to be notified when I post new knitting and yarn related videos. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.